Now, a few months ago, while introducing his campaign manifesto, Nigeria's president, Volamed Tinubu, highlighted security of life and property as a top priority for his administration. His strategy was to, uh, to achieve this, of course, uh, according to him, is to first pull most Nigerians out of poverty and provide the basic needs for a decent life and social justice for all, irrespective of region, tribe, and religion. Insecurity has become a major threat to the nation's upbuilding, and since its inauguration, reports of insurgencies and kidnapping in the northern state of the southeast have continued to surge. Human Rights Watch, in an article dated months back, advised President Bolaame Tinubu to ensure that you know he sticks to promoting civilian protection in conflict areas and bolster the social safety net to tackle entrenched poverty and inequality, just to mention a few. We have a Nigerian researcher at Human Rights Watch, Aniet Ewang. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Let's look at how Nigeria is faring in the global rankings regarding human rights in Africa. I mean, it's, it's not always easy to compare and, and rank countries' human rights performance based because the context and the dynamics in various places are very different. I think sometimes it's a more useful exercise to sort of analyze the conduct of the countries based on the relevant laws and standards that should apply, including the local laws that have been adopted, as well as the international human rights laws that bind them, um, as opposed to holding them up against other countries. Although this is also um, very helpful, and there are some organizations that have taken on this enormous task of trying to rank countries based on their performance or public perception. Um, one of them is the, the World Justice Project in Washington, D.C., that employs a very interesting methodology that involves household surveys and interviews to sort of score and rank countries. Um, this year, just in October, a report that they released ranked Nigeria 120 out of 142 countries in terms of adherence to the rule of law. Um, on more specific issues, Nigeria was ranked the second worst country in sub-Saharan Africa out of 34 countries that were analyzed on issues around security. Um, I mean, it's important to, to, to highlight that these rankings aren't exactly conclusive, but they give a good sense of how Nigeria is faring, um, or at least how people perceive Nigeria to be faring on some fundamental human rights issues, which the authorities should pay attention to. So we're talking about security challenges, including insurgencies, killings, communal and sectarian um, violence that threaten the human rights of millions. Um, and also issues around abuses by, by the military and law enforcement agencies that often engage in um, extrajudicial killings, torture, and other abuses. I mean, these are just some of the many concerns that the authorities should be paying attention to. Well, um, they're, you know, pretty severe. And of course, uh, lately killings and kidnappings seem to have resurfaced in the north. You know, we just also spoke about Benue State, you know, attacks on... Um, I mean, there's many reasons. There's also been attacks on women and children. Um, how do you think the Nigerian government can, you know, curb this spread and, of course, maybe also fix Nigeria's security challenges um, one step at a time? He's spoken about, you know, fighting poverty, but one of the first things he did basically threw the country into, you know, even more poverty. Um, we've also not seen a lot of sincere steps with regards to our, our um, uh, investments in security infrastructure. So... Where do you think we're headed? Um, I think it's it's first important to, to appreciate that it's a very complex issue. The issues around insecurity um, in the Northwest or the North Central or the Northeast are complex issues that have gone on for years. Um, it's not something that's happened uh, just recently. And so it's, it's an enormous task and we should appreciate that. But I think the most important thing, first and foremost, that the authorities need to do is provide adequate protection for citizens in this area. I mean, this is a core function of government. It's an obligation that they must meet up to. Um, and providing security means that those that are tasked with this duty should be equipped with all the resources that they need to be able to carry out their function appropriately while respecting rights and upholding the rule of law. Um, I've been out to some of these places. I've interviewed security agents who have really 
decried the lack of resources, um, including, uh, you know, adequate weapons and, um, you know, uh, proper intelligence to be able to counter a lot of the attacks that they're supposed to be uh, responding to. Um, and I think it's also important that in upholding the, the 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 rights of people in this area by ensuring that they're safe, the authorities and the security forces need to really respect um, the rule of law. Uh, we've seen in many cases how responding to whether it's insurgencies or in some cases, counterterrorism operations have been very abusive. They've led to, you know, even more grievances against the citizens because people have been killed arbitrarily. That's also something that must be um, really considered as the authorities seek to carry out their function of, of keeping people safe. But I think another thing that's important at this point is for the authorities to pay attention to the rising humanitarian crisis um, that has become very glaring in many of the areas affected by insecurity. Um, people have been displaced from their homes, their communities. They're forced to live in precarious conditions with very little or no access to, to basic necessities such as shelter, such as food, such as water. So it's important for the authorities to remember that these people have also have rights to be adequately taken care of, to feel safe and secure. And, um, and they, I mean the government, has the responsibility to do this. And, and I think my last point on this is around the fact that a lot of the response from the authorities have been militarized. Um, the response in dealing with issues of insecurity, especially in, in the Northwest and North Central, where we're seeing these kidnappings and killings on the rise. But I think it's critical for them to look beyond this and really start to sort of focus on the root causes of the crisis. Um, lots of local and international organizations and think tanks have done important work studying these crises and underlying um, a lot of the drivers of, of, of the violence and, and the insecurity. Um, it's important for, for the government to, to really start from here to try to respond. Um, I'll give you an example in the Northwest where these killings and kidnappings are rampant um, by bandit groups. Uh, Several drivers, including the proliferation of weapons gutting from across Nigeria's poorest borders, have been identified as, as key issues that must be addressed. We also have issues around land use and ethno-religious dynamics in parts of the North Central as well um, that are drivers of, of crisis and conflict there. Um, but the authorities have not yet been able to successfully navigate um, these issues and come up with a solution um, that is acceptable to everyone. Um, and we see that these issues are morphing into broader security concerns with even more security implications for the country. Right. And now let's talk about the rule of law and exactly what, what you know, is being at play here in Nigeria. Talking about checks and balances, um, each arm of government checkmating the other, we've seen a flagrant disrespect or defiance of the law that should protect citizens. And uh, we've seen many examples with the arrest of former CBN Governor Godwin Emefele, who has been in detention, you know, for, despite court injunctions, he's been in detention. We've seen that not just with him, we saw it with Abdul Rashid Ba. Yes, he's been released. We've seen that with Anam Dekanu. We've seen that with uh, several others, Dasuki. How, do, how is Nigeria faring? How do we get to a point where we can comfortably say that indeed the supremacy of the law, you know, over the rulers and the rules is being put into effect and that each arm of government is checkmating the other properly? I mean, we can only come to that point when the various arms of government, you know, um, decide or you know, they show political will to actually respect um, the functions of all the others. And one fundamental issue that remains core, and I think it has already come out in this conversation, is the fact that um, Nigeria's human rights record in terms of respect for the rule of law, uh, especially by government authorities such as security agencies and those who instruct them, um, is 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 failing, um, and there you like you rightly know that there are several other cases where the authorities have failed to comply with court orders, and this threatens the role of the courts and it shreds the respect and trust citizens have for the institution as an arbiter of justice that plays a critical role in the democratic process. The role of the judiciary in upholding democracy, which enshrines human rights, I mean, it cannot be overemphasized. Um, as you said, it's
the singular power to its its singular power to act as a, a check on the other two arms of government. Um, that is the executive and the legislature, and it is only judiciary the judiciary that can void. Um, the actions of both arms when they act contrary to law or the constitution and when this important function of the judiciary cannot be carried out or when there is a question about its effectiveness in doing this singular function, it becomes a threat to democracy. And the point in, in especially with regards to, you know, the, the arbitrary detention of um, a lot of these uh, people that you mentioned is that Everyone that is brought before or under the justice process, regardless of their profile or what they're accused of, is entitled to due process of the law. This is a basic protection for everyone that we cannot afford to negotiate because it is meant to actually protect citizens. And any excesses of the security agencies that is condoned in one case will continue to be repeated in others. And this is something that we've seen um, for you know decades. Uh, that we're trying to change. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, we must recognize that justice is a double-edged sword in the sense that in, in the same way we want the law to be used to get accountability from people who are accused of wrongdoing, um, regardless of who they are, it is that same law that has laid out basic protections for anyone that is accused, um, regardless of who they are again. And, and, and this must be respected. Um. I mean, but the, the current situation, you know, just doesn't look pretty at all. Uh, but we'll move away from the courts, you know, and, and, and look at some other aspects, you know, that I, uh, you know, I believe are uh, major concerns for Nigerians. Um, we, of course, went through the February elections. Uh, we, of course, still have uh, off-cycle elections coming, you know, in, uh, this weekend. What would you say needs to be, you know, put in place for a free and fair poll? You know, of course, if you remember, there was a lot of disenfranchisement that happened in the previous elections. There was a lot of bigotry also, not just disenfranchisement. There was thuggery, there was bigotry, there was failure of INEC to, you know, carry out its functions, you know, effectively. And a lot of people have lost faith in the process. So what would you say must work with Nigeria's leadership recruitment process? No, you're absolutely right that um, the the February elections um, had a lot of flaws, and I think for many people it was disappointing because as as we move further towards democratic consolidation, or as we hope to move further towards uh, democratic consolidation, the conduct of elections is is key in in how citizens. Um, see the process, whether or not there's trust, whether or not it's safe. Um, and insecurity was among many of the other factors that led to citizens' disenfranchisement during the elections earlier this year. And I think from our research, which primarily focused on, on violence and insecurity across the country, um, we saw this happen in three ways. The first was the more glaring attacks, the killings, um, and, and the threats against uh, uh, citizens and, and other and actors in the elections, um, and also the destruction of voting materials at the polls by those that we popularly call political thugs. Um, and there was also violence by security personnel acting on behalf of politicians or political parties. Um, and, and thirdly, there was you know insecurity again in some areas, which made it impossible for polling units to be set up and for people to come out to vote. Um, now, these are issues the authorities should be looking critically at and trying to address in the upcoming elections. Um, I think from our perspective, some of the recommendations that we've made and we continue to make is that the authorities need to put in place adequate security measures across the country, across the three states where we're having um, the off-season elections, for citizens to be able to exercise their rights to vote. This should ideally involve the where this is something that should have been done ahead of the elections, way ahead of the elections. It should ideally involve a mapping of the areas of concern in terms of insecurity and the um, coming up with concrete plans to ensure that they can manage the situation um, in a way that engenders trust in those who are deployed um, to conduct the elections so that they actually go, they trust that it's safe to go to these areas and set up polling booths, um, and also those who will participate. So election does not become uh, a situation where they lose their lives. 
um, it's also important for them to ensure that uh, security forces deployed during the elections act in accordance with the law. Now, there are a number of um, policies that have been adopted recently to allow this happen. But I think in terms of enforcement, we haven't really seen any enforcement. We hear and we see sometimes even videos of security forces or even, you know, political thugs um, acting against citizens, destroying the process. But there is never any accountability. And that continues to obviously send the message that you can do whatever you want and get away with it. Um, and, you know, another thing that needs to happen is for the authorities to put in place adequate measures, uh, including a sort of response mechanisms that would uh, address any issues of violence and violations as soon as they arrive, as soon as they arise at the polls during the elections. Um, but I think for us, the, the key message and what I guess we're hoping the authorities take away from um, all of our, our reporting and documenting on violence during the elections is that more needs to be done to ensure accountability for violence during elections, um, whether it's by security forces or by citizens or at the instance of political parties themselves, we need to start seeing um, um, accountability. We need to start seeing people being held responsible for their actions. It's And it's one of the only ways in which we can actually um, make our elections process a bit more credible and enshrine, you know, uh, or engender trust in... Yeah, in it's also important to mention, um, it's also important to mention, you know, that you know, while we talk about violence in the electoral process, it's not done by aliens. So there's also a role that citizens need to play uh, to understand that they, you know, cannot continuously be used by these politicians and these players uh, to ruin the electoral process uh, for peanuts. Um, you know, so, so, you know, the Nigerian citizen, as much as he will complain and cry that we need better elections and a better country, also has a role to play um, um, in all of this. But thank you very much, Aniete Ewang, for stopping by. Uh, very interesting conversation with you. Of course, on Saturday, we'll see if there's been any changes or any difference in the electoral process. But most importantly, uh, the Nigerians and, of course, the human rights um, ratings across the continent and across the world, um, so much work needs to be done. We'll be speaking with you again. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You, you too. As well.